Well, welcome back. Good to see you. I see a twinkle returning in a few people's eyes. I've always said, drop me into any one of my stop smoking clinics and I'll tell you which night it is and I won't have to ask you. Because, you know, you come that first night and everybody has that look on their face, well, I wonder where the hook is, is this going to work, I don't know. You know what I mean? They have that uh, skeptical look. Second night, you look like somebody grabbed you by the left leg and pulled you through a knot hole backwards. <laughs> and then as the week wears on, I can see, it's in the eyes, I think, the twinkle begins to return to the corner of the eyes, and it isn't all back yet. Some of you look still quite distressed. You too. But uh, you're all going to, you just watch now. You watch the eyes with me. Will you do that? Tomorrow night? Oh, yeah. Friday night, the twinkle will be back. Isn't that going to be good? We, we can just watch for that. Well, just in case you think it only happens on films, I have some guests who volunteered to come and talk to you tonight. So why don't we have uh, our friends come up here? Why don't we put you on this side, and you can stay on this side, and... Uh, hey, oh, no, stay right here. That's good. We'll go with ladies first. How's that? Well, would you care to give us your name? Jean Purdy. Hey. No, it's not too loud. All right. And, uh, Jean, um, what happened to you? I had done what he had described to you at the beginning of the program. You had your voice box removed. Right. How, long, how long ago was that? Six and a half years ago. So you think probably you got a cure out of that? I certainly hope so. Yeah. When you were smoking, uh, laryngectomy never crossed your mind, I presume. Never heard of the word before. I was the first one I knew that was a laryngectomy. I've met many more since then. Um... What advice do you have for these folks here? For heaven's sake, you've got a choice. Please stop smoking. Would you believe that there's fair numbers of my patients who uh, I take out their voice box and then they smoke through the hole in their neck where they breathe? Yep. Now, just a minute. Is it smarter to quit before you have the trouble or afterwards? What would you advise them to quit before, before or after? Right now. You think yeah. it's a good time? What do you think about these people? They're a pretty good-looking group, huh? They sure are. Oh, what can you do to encourage them here? Give them, give them a real word. I can really scare you. <laughs> I'm the, um, my son was egg and grows you out. Um, I'm the third one in my family with cancer. All smoking-related cancers. My dad died at the age of 61 with cancer of the bladder. We now know that was smoking related i was the second one after 25 years of smoking to develop laryngeal cancer and i when i was diagnosed i had five percent chance survival so they really shot the works i had surgery which involved um right and left neck dissection and across the middle it almost removed my head after that, they did radiation, and after that, chemotherapy. And I was one of the lucky ones. I'm still here. Two years later, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer, and she looked much worse than the lady you saw in film. It's nothing worse than seeing someone you love die, that kind of a death. So you think these people are doing the right thing? I certainly do. Shall we give her a hand for coming? Now, for your information, the type of uh, speech she's using is electrolarynx. It's a battery that makes a little beeper sound, and then she holds it against her throat, and she's able to articulate that sound. There's several ways people learn to speak. Maybe we should bring someone with a puncture. We have a esophageal speaker here. Puncture also. Well, you have the puncture I too. Have both, yes. So you you can uh, you you can you can do, do a little you can do a little yeah. double talk. Right. Okay. Uh, how long ago did you have your laryngectomy? It'll be seven years in March. You want to tell us your name? My name is Rod Jennings. I had my surgery, it's a seven years ago in March. I was very fortunate that I did not have to undergo chemo or radiation. 
the surgery seemed to take care of it all. But uh, I do a lot of work now trying to convince other people not to smoke and also not to drink because they go hand in hand. And it's not just adding together the chances, but it is doubling and multiplying the chances if you smoke and drink both. So I, that's my message. Give up the cigarettes now and try to cut down on the liquor if you are drinking. Well, what do you think about that advice? Think that's good advice? <laughs> now, you might be interested how he talks. You see, he has a little tube that goes through from his trachea into his uh, esophagus. Well, you brought one along to show them. And this uh, is a little one-way valve so that the fluid can't get into his trachea, but he can blow air into his esophagus. And uh, then that vibrates back there in his pharynx. He doesn't have vocal cords anymore, and he articulates uh, that uh, vibrating uh, uh, pharynx or esophagus. Oh, yeah. Well, you can see the hole that he has here and the little tube that's stuck in it. So maybe you enjoy the technical aspects of this uh, presentation as well. Well, we appreciate you folks coming, and thank you very much. Let's give them a chance. We appreciate you coming. Thanks a lot. God bless. Okay? Thank you. You might mention if there's any swimmers or singers in the group that's, that's gone forever also. No swimming, no singing, she says, once it's done. But you can, uh, you can have a distinctive type of speech. <laughs> Thank you for coming. All right, well, let's talk to some of our group here and see how they're feeling. Why don't we start with the lady in the middle? Come right on up. These uh, people have been picked at random from our uh, group and have volunteered to come up. We're tickled to have you here. I'm glad to be here. What's your first name? Diane. Diane, how much are you used to smoking a while back? Uh, about one and a half packs Back a and a half a day. What made you decide that now was an appropriate time to quit? Well, I'm getting a little older, and I guess I'm deciding I'm not going to live forever. I'd like to be healthy, so you, and it's time. So you largely a health motive that, uh, that has you... Uh, uh, any of your family uh, encouraging you to do this, or do you have smokers in the family? My two kids are encouraging me, and my husband's still smoking. I, I saw some youngsters here with you. Yes, um, my daughter. She um, she thinks Mama ought to quit. Oh yes. Maybe that film will help her to see that uh, Mama is going to do it. I think. I see you're wearing your button real brightly there. I wore it to work, and I'm wearing it here. And... So how has the program been going? Um, pretty well. I feel better today. Yesterday you felt a little worse. Yesterday I went crazy. <laughs> Today I had urges kind of in waves. Uh -huh. And I would, it seems to forget about it for a while, and then all of a sudden I, the urge would come on me. So it's better. What, uh, what symptoms did you have in particular? Mm, I'm very nervous. Just Very nervous. Just sort of shaky and... Yeah. And I, was, I seemed to be plugged up all day today. Your, your head was plugged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No headache, though. No headache. No. Aren't you proud of her? She's wearing her button proudly. Thank you. All right, let's have this gentleman right here. How do you do, sir? How are you, sir? Where's your button? I had slipped. Oh, today? Today. You got off the first day, and today, what happened? I don't quite know how to explain it, but I went and bought a pack of cigarettes and I had a cigarette. Not just Similar enough. to another program I was in that I didn't make too good a success until just recently. So now just, oh yeah, we won't ask you what that program was. Oh, it's AA, I'm very proud AA, of it. AA, and you got off that finally, but you had to learn the hard way. The very hard way. Uh-huh. So now let's go back to this moment you went to buy the cigarettes. What, what went through your mind at that moment? Uh, what was the thinking? I uh, think it was boredom. Uh, I'm a widower and I'm retired. I had too much free time on my hands. How much are you used to smoking? Two packs a day. Uh-huh. 
And you went and bought a pack of cigarettes. I certainly did. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then you smoked one cigarette. That is correct. And what'd you do with the rest of the pack? They're at home. <laughs> what do you think, folks? Well, he, he put his button in his pocket, but I think he's going to chuck those things when he gets home tonight. What do you think? I will try. I will do it. What's your first name? Art. See Art? yours. Art. Yeah, that's a good name. <laughs> that's what I tell my patients. Everything I do is a work of art. <laughs> anyway, listen. We're going to check in with you tomorrow night. You promise to be here? I certainly do. We're going to find out about you. What do you think? You think you can make it? Yeah. Get rid of those cigarettes. Let's give him a hand. Okay. Thank you very much. Ooh, come on. As I tell you, we pick them at random. You see, we didn't stack the deck, huh? That should be proof. Hi, what's your first name? Pat. Pat. How much were you used to smoking, Pat? Oh, uh, about two packs a day. About two packs a day. Mm -hmm. And um, how's the program been going for you? Not too bad. A little bit tired today. A little bit tired. Yesterday you weren't tired. No. But today you are tired. Mm -hmm. Anybody else tired here? <laughs> well, you're not alone, at least. You know, I came here Monday just out of curiosity. You came here out of curiosity. <laughs> I mean, well, you, what, what, you mean, curious about what? Whether you were going to wave a magic wand and I was going to quit smoking. <laughs> and you found out it didn't work that way. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. But uh, something must have happened. I see you're wearing a button here. Uh -huh. You got religion there that first night. That's right. I decided to pack my own chute. I, I, I think that... <laughs> I, I think that's a tremendously uh, good attitude. What symptoms have you had while you're quitting? Uh, it hasn't been too bad, but I have to keep um, a cup with the straw and with the fruit juice by me constantly. And you keep snipping on that every once in a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, pretty, that's a lot better mm -hmm. than going out and buying a pack of cigarettes. Right, right. So that's the one thing that's been my crutch right now. Oh. Uh, Let's compare yesterday with today for you. What would you say would be the difference between yesterday and today? Uh, today, I didn't seem to be as nervous. I didn't need to chew on a pencil as bad, uh -huh. but I was more tired. <laughs> you can die with splinters in your neck, yeah. if you understand. <laughs> okay. Well, don't you think she's doing good? Yeah. Let's give her a hand. Thank you for that. 38 years smoking. 38 years of smoking. You started when you were two. <laughs> okay. Um, let's have this gentleman right here. <coughs> Greetings. What's your name? Stan, Stan McNiff. Stan, how much uh, were you used to smoking? Uh, when I smoked, it was uh, about a pack a day. Where's your button? Well, uh, I, didn't, uh, uh, I, I didn't take a button this time. I took your course uh, 23 years ago, and it worked. And uh, I'm here tonight to to support my son, to, to help him. Oh, well, you're not a smoker. No, I'm not. But I'm you took it 23 years ago. Uh, in, in those days, uh, you said, I choose not to smoke. Right. Well, we, got, we changed that a little bit. To, yeah. I love being free from smoking. <laughs> we, take, we got sort of a positive, we changed it from a little negative to a positive attitude. Right. You remember that pretty well then. Oh, yes. When was that? Uh, it was uh, 23 years ago, 1967. Isn't it interesting? People always remember when they quit smoking. It was 3 o'clock <laughs> on the 24th. I had people come up and tell me, you know, years later, the day, that, where was the place? It was in, uh, I lived in Redford Township then. You came over uh, to the school. Uh, we did one in the school there. That's right. Well, I'm glad to see you. You see, we did take them at random, didn't we? But uh, 23 years success, right. and you're glad you quit. No question about it. Let's give that a your life is much better. Let's get, and, and you're here to support someone else. That's right. That's right. Isn't that great? Let's give him a big hand. You remember last night we had this fella up here? I told him he had to come back tonight. Now, what was the story you were giving me last night here? What was that name again? 
Uh, my name is Fred. Is Fred, that... yeah, Fred, Fred. That was it. <laughs> okay. And as it seems to me, we had we had some kind of lame brain excuses or something. What was that? About the stress. Yeah, about the stress. Right. And uh, what had happened? Well, I don't know if that's a lame brain. Lame. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't, but it's, it, it just sounded to me like an excuse. Um, no, I think it was for real. I didn't go to work today. I just. <laughs> I walked in, I went to work for about a half an hour. <laughs> and then you left. Well, I concentrated. I, I really want to make this thing work. And um, so I thought it was more important to quit smoking than to worry about and, and dealing with something else. Let, let me tell you this. <laughs> he made a very important decision. Can I share, share a story with you? And I'll, I'll make the same offer to you. One night I was putting on a stop smoking clinic in Milwaukee. And well, I put these things on in a lot of places. I put them on in Karachi, Pakistan. I put them on in Taipei, Taiwan. And we put them on in Phoenix. I only go there in February. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we put them on in uh, several other places. But this one was in Milwaukee. Um, a few interesting things. In those days, I used to carry around a bucket with some organs in them. And I, I had this lung, and it was interesting. When I went through the, um, uh, to check in at the airplane, you know, the fellow says, what do you have in that box, bucket? And I said, you don't want to know. He says, but I have to check it. I said, okay, take a look. He says, what's that? I said, that's the people parts that I have removed, uh, cancerous parts. And he said, really? And he took his cigarettes, he gave them to me. He said, go ahead, here's my cigarettes. <laughs> That was a short stop smoking program, but anyhow, <laughs> I, I got in Milwaukee, and it was on um, the second night, I believe. Second night, just before the program st started, the phone rang in, in the back of the auditorium, and I was the only one there, basically, so I picked up the phone, and I said, hello, and the fellow said, uh, is Dr. Weaver there? I said, speaking. Oh, good. He said, I'm a journalist for the Milwaukee whatever, Milwaukee newspaper of some sort. He says, I have a daily byline. I smoke four packs of cigarettes a day. I've sat in front of my typewriter for three hours. Nothing will come. He says, I'm going to get fired. I say, no, you won't get fired. Come to the clinic. I'll write you a sick leave. He says, how can you do that? I said, you are sick, aren't you? Yeah, I said, if you had diarrhea, what would you do? You'd stay home. This is worse than diarrhea. You can't even function. Not only that, I'd rather give you sick leave now than write your sick leave when you have your cancer of your throat or cancer of the lung. I said, you come to the clinic, I'll write you the excuse, and uh, we'll get you off that habit. He came to the clinic. About four months later, I received a letter from him. He said, Dear Doctor, I just wanted you to know that that night was my watershed. He said, I was either going back to smoking or coming to the clinic. I decided to come to the clinic. I haven't smoked since the clinic. I'm off four packs a day, and I want you to know how happy I am for the advice you gave me. I didn't give it to you, but you took the right, you made the right decision. Yeah. And what happened today? Well, I made it for the uh, so well, since, since about four, four o'clock yesterday. And you didn't smoke? Right. <laughs> and uh, you were, as I remember, a three pack a day smoker. Right. right. Personally, let hmm. me present you. Well, thank you very much. Button. Let's give him a big hand. Isn't he wonderful? Let's give him a hand. <laughs> All right, now, I know that there's a thousand and one questions out there you've been wanting to ask about the smoking habit, health in general, things you've seen in the films, otherwise, and I want to take some time right now to, to clear the air. So who's the first one with a question? Here's a one question right up here. Stand right up, and they'll come and um, um, they'll get you on the uh, thing here. Yes, go I ahead. Want, I want to know if you ever smoked. You want to know if I ever smoked. A lot of people want to know that. I guess the assumption is that if you never smoked, you couldn't help anybody stop smoking. 
But I point out to many people that there are a lot of obstetricians that are men. <laughs> and very few people choose their psychiatrist by the number of years he's been in the mental institution. <laughs> and I must admit that I never was an established smoker. I did try corn silks once and decided it wasn't very good. But, if I can put your mind at ease, I've helped over 100,000 people stop smoking. And I know this habit better than you know it, even though you're a smoker, because I know every trick that this habit can play on you. And we're going to talk about a lot of those tomorrow night. Do not, under any circumstances, miss tomorrow night's lecture. Because the lecture is entitled, How to Keep On Keeping Off. Because you're finding it's difficult to quit, right? In some ways, it's even more difficult to stay quit. Not that it's difficult, but it's tricky. Because this tobacco habit will play tricks on you. I know what those tricks are, and I'll share them with you tomorrow. So you be sure and be here, okay? Not only that, but tomorrow night I'm going to share with you my own film that I made about smoking. I hope you'll enjoy it. All right. Other questions? Yes, right here in the back. Let's get this gentleman. Go ahead, sir. I have noticed um, that uh, I have gotten an, uh, a sore throat, and it's stayed with me since I came off the cigarettes. Didn't have it before. It's been there since I've been out smoking, and then obviously the excessive tiredness and confusion and all that good bit. You've had all those things, but this, the, the sore throat. Let me point out something to you, and perhaps uh, we can answer your question. Anybody else here notice that they're getting a sore throat? <coughs> Several people. Many of you <coughs> that haven't had it already will get one about tomorrow. I'll tell you what happens. Every smoker has a sore throat. But because smoke is somewhat anesthetic, they don't know it. I can tell a smoker when I look in his mouth. I don't even need to ask him. It looks red. It looks irritated. It looks sore. But because he's smoking all the time, he's kind of got the nerves dulled there. Do you understand what I'm saying? And he doesn't feel it. Once he quits smoking, he begins to feel the sore throat, and it takes usually a few weeks for that inflammation to get out because the sense of sensation returns much quicker than the inflammation clears up. Now, some people are probably noticing they're awful, also coughing more than they did before they quit smoking. Same principle applies. Two different things happen. Number one, Sensation returns to the bronchus, okay? But in addition to that, there are little hair cells down there. Remember, you, we talked about those the other day, that clear out the mucus. They completely go to sleep when you, uh, when you uh, smoke. They cease to work. Now, when you stop smoking, if the hair cells are still present, they'll grow back later most of the time if uh, they're not there they begin to beat. Now you've got the sensation and you've got the crud coming up from the bottom. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you start to cough and clean it out. And that may take several weeks before you get... Did you ever clean out the basement and notice there wasn't much dust down there until you begin sweeping? Well, basically, it's the same type of thing that happens here. You're starting to clear out uh, the mess. The other sensation that will be returning for most of you about tomorrow is your sense of smell. Many of you will discover by tomorrow that you drove here in a stinky, stinky car. <laughs> and you didn't know that all of this time. Not only that, you'll find your whole wardrobe stinks. It's amazing how pervasive that tobacco smoke is. And when your sense of smell returns, you'll be able to pick a smoker out a mile away. Just let them walk by and you can tell it. But the smoker doesn't know that because they don't think it smells. My wife and I bought a house several years ago, and the people that lived in it smoked heavily. 
18 months later, if we'd go away and close that thing up on the weekend, we'd come back, it would smell like an ashtray. And the first thing we'd come in the house, we'd open all the windows and clear the place out. That stuff gets in the carpets, it gets in the woodwork, it gets in the walls, and it takes a long time to get it out. So that's some of the sensations that's coming back. All right, other questions that have been troubling you. Here's a question right down here. We'll get yours over here, too. Go ahead. Hi. I'd just like to know how long it takes before the nervousness that you don't get from smoking comes back when you're not. How soon does, when do you get comfortable? She's not having any trouble, is she? <coughs> when do you get comfortable not smoking as well as you do having a cigarette and a coffee smoke? Oh, when do you become table? comfortable? Is that the yes. question? Yeah. All right. The worst of the symptoms goes in three days. All right? Now, I'm not saying that you'll be completely comfortable. But what I'm saying is no one ever told me that the fourth day was the worst. It's a little bit like climbing a mountain. Did you ever do that? You know, you're some ups and some downs, but it's all up until you get up there on the top and then you look out and what do you see? Every direction looks down. And that's where you're going to be come about uh, fourth day here, you see. Ooh, look at that. Things are looking up. But then you start down, and there are still a few ups. You know what I'm saying? As you go down the hill, and it's going to be that way. There will be some times when you think, oh, man, I thought I was over this, but it looks like I still got it. But basically, after four days, it's downhill from the physiologic point of view. Now, the psychological associations take much longer to change. And tomorrow night, we're going to get into that in some depth. Because usually it's the psychological things that take people back to smoking, and it's the physiological things that keep them from getting off from smoking. We had a question right back here. Stand right up there, and we'll take your question. I've, I've noticed in the last two or three days that I get really cold. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a heavy, I've been a heavy smoker for you know, many years. All right. And I just got my button, you know, this... I've only been off for a total of about 26 hours. All right, there's, let me tell you, thank you. Many changes take place when you quit smoking. The main effect is right down in the deepest part of your brain called the hypothalamus, where all of the mechanisms are controlled. You know, it's in the autonomic nervous system. You might want to call it the automatic nervous system. Aren't you glad we have that? You know, if you stood up and we didn't have that, you'd faint. But you stand up, your blood vessels and your feet contract, your heart gives a little extra squeeze, all because of sensations that come from your carotid arteries and tell them, hey, I need more blood. Up here, it's all automatically handled. Aren't you glad that when you eat, you don't have to say, I think I want a little more trypsin, throw in some lipase, I'll take some, some of these other enzymes. A little more hydrochloric acid, please. No, it's all automatically handled. Your temperature control is all automatic. And your emotional control is largely automatic. That's why some people have giddy spells, uh, et cetera. So temperature control is one of those things. Some people get warm. Some people get cold. Some people think they're going through menopause. <laughs> but uh, that will clear up. Now, there's a couple of things people ask me about that they don't want to stand and talk about. One of them is, lady says, what do I do about all this gas? And another one says, I'm having diarrhea. Yeah. Your gut tract is also under automatic or autonomic control. And when you stop smoking, it may be slow in moving things along. Gas accumulates because bacteria accumulate that make the gas. I don't know what to do. Live outside, I think. <laughs> uh, or maybe you can do like my little four-year-old granddaughter said to me, Grandpa, I feel flatulence. And that really, her, hus her uh, father's a doctor, you understand. But... Um, uh, that will clear up in short order, although some people will have loose stools and some people will be constipated for some significant period of time. But it will adjust and it will return to normal. 
and there are some things you can do if you're having tend to have loose stools. Um, drink a lot of water to make up for the fluid you, you lose, and uh, now that you can put some milk and something like that, you can try some boiled milk or something like that. That will help to, to uh, uh, steady it up. If you're constipated, then put a lot of bulk in there, and that will help it to move on. But all of these things will come back uh, to normal. All right, here's a question right here. Yeah, uh, it, I've been smoking for about 15 years. I need to know how long does it take for your lungs to try to uh, reverse the damage that has been done, and how long does it take to, uh, for your lungs to get back to uh, the way they were before you started smoking? Okay, that's good. Just have a seat because that, uh, that almost gives me a lecture right there. <clears throat> People ask, now that I've stopped smoking, what are my, what are my uh, chances, you see? Well, there's several things. Let's talk to you about what your main immediate advantage is, and that has to do with your heart. You see, the smoker carries about 15% of his oxygen-carrying capacity around his carbon monoxide. Doesn't carry any oxygen. You've heard about carbon monoxide. That's toxin. So he's got a lot of blood circulating without oxygen. It's just got carbon monoxide. Heart is working to get the oxygen out there, but it's pushing around dead weight. Do you understand what I'm saying? In addition to that, nicotine works on the little blood vessels in the legs and the fingers. I once did some tests on a patient at our, I wasn't a patient, it was actually an employee at the hospital, where we would measure the blood flow to the fingers because I was interested in how much constriction one got from smoking one cigarette. The blood flow in his fingers reduced 50% with one cigarette. So what you have here is a heart pushing around a lot of non-oxygen. The blood vessels are constricted, making it difficult to get the blood out to the tissues. So what is the heart doing? Mm, 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 mm. And the blood pressure is up and it's under a load trying to get the blood out to oxygenate the tissues. Now, that you stop smoking, you see. Within a day or two, you're carrying full load of oxygen. The peripheral vessels are relaxed. And what does your heart do? Instead of going, mm, 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 it says, this is fun. Love them, <laughs> love them, <laughs> love them, <laughs> love them. Because you see, your heart rate has dropped about 10 beats a minute. Your blood pressure's dropped about 10 points, and your heart is loafing along and smiling. And you have immediately reduced your risk of dying a heart attack significantly, like adding five years to your life just like that. Isn't that good? And you've got that right now. Now, that's the good news. Now, some of the other things take longer. Um, one of the, let me just bring this out here because we're going to need it a little bit later anyway. As far as the lungs are concerned, I pointed out to you that the cilia, if they're gone, it takes a while for them to come back. Um, it takes a while for the inflammation to get out. If you have emphysema and you've actually broken the alveoli, they're non-repairable, but some of the chronic bronchitis that's associated with it may clear up, and certainly you've got more oxygen-carrying capacity because you got rid of the carbon monoxide, so there's gain, gain there. Lung cancer uh, is interesting because you, people say, well, it takes 10 or 15 years before you come the same as a non-smoker, and that seems a little discouraging, but let me show you how this works. Let's say this is our risk of the smoker here. This is the risk of our smoker. It's up here. Here's the risk of the non-smoker down here. And these are the years out here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, something like that. What happens is that within a year to two, you'll drop this risk nearly half and then there is a long slow tail do you understand what I'm saying 
so that after four or five years, you've got rid of about 80% of the risk, but it's not quite the same yet as a non-smoker. But within a year or two, your risk of cancer drops significantly. And uh, it takes a few years before it's the same, basically, as a non-smoker. Some people say 10 years, some say 15 years. But that's because this tail is, is pretty flat and uh, somewhat uh, long. All right, other questions? Yes, here's a question right over here. I want to know how you feel about uh, using Nicorette gum. I started using that today. A doctor gave it to me a month or so ago. Okay, there may be a place for Nicorette gum. I don't recommend it. What it does, it keeps the nicotine habit alive. We, we, we would like to get you off. As far as your heart is concerned, which is your greatest risk, it continues that risk. Uh, there may be a place for it in the individual who can't quit smoking and has emphysema or chronic bronchitis or is a risk for a cancer or something, but we, we, we suggest that you won't need it, okay? Question here. <clears throat> I know over the last several years that I've smoked, my voice has lowered a few octaves, and I wondered exactly what causes that, and will that stay the same? All right, she says her voice has dropped in the last several years. Um, she wonders, uh, that can be a cause of smoking because of the swelling or edema that your vocal cords uh, have. There may be some scarring on it that thickens it so that it vibrates a little slower. How much of that will change is a little hard to say. Depends on what the real cause of the uh, deepening of the voice is. But it may well improve some. I wouldn't guarantee it'll be the same. Question way in the back here. Let's see if we can get this lady's question. I've got two or three questions people have asked me. First of all, I would like to know, for those of us that are non-smokers, how bad is secondhand smoke and what damage will it do to us? All You're a non-smoker. That's right. You're here supporting someone. That's right. All right. I'll, I'll, go ahead and ask your other questions. Also, what can the group do next week for moral support and what can those with sore throats take? Those were the other questions. All right, let's, let's take the first question first. Yes, there is an increased risk for a smoker, a non-smoker who lives with a smoking spouse or works in a smoking environment. It's not of the same quality as smoking, however. Probably in the neighborhood of two to three times the risk of not being totally in, in a non-smoking environment, whereas the smoker has about 25 times the risk of the non-smoker. So there is some increased risk there. If you work in a smoking environment and you have a smoking spouse, it's worse than if you say work in a smoking environment and you have a non-smoking at home or you have a smoking spouse and you work in a non-smoking environment. Because for the non-smoker, it gives him a chance to clean out the tires and the crud, you see. Uh, question, uh, what can we do next week? We're going to have several suggestions to you, for you, tomorrow and on the final days of what you can do to um, keep off support systems and uh, other such things as that. Sore throat, I guess you can suck on a lozenge or something of that. It will go away. doesn't need antibiotics. It's due to the inflammation and time will be the cure for that uh, problem. All right? Other questions? Let's take this gentleman's question right here. I'd like to know what it'll do for my cholesterol. All right, his question is, what will stopping smoking do for his cholesterol? Smoking does kick up the cholesterol a bit, as a general rule. Should drop it a bit. But uh, mainly uh, diet is the way to take care of cholesterol. Diet and uh, exercise, and if you're interested in that, you probably better get a hold of one of our cooking programs. We have those, and we'll give you a chance to sign up for those. But um, uh, diet is the best thing, but smoking will improve it. But it gives you a lot of other benefits as far as heart disease is concerned. You see, one of the things that's, that cigarettes do, it makes your platelets sticky. Now, platelets are what starts blood clots. If you have a narrowed artery, 
and then the platelets are sticky, they'll make a clot there much sooner. That's why some people give people aspirin so that the clots won't form so quickly because they make the platelets less sticky. Um, but uh, the smoker, when he quits smoking, his platelets become less sticky without the aspirin and uh, his risk goes down significantly for the other things I've, uh, I've mentioned. There was a lady right over here somewhere, right here. Can we, can we get her question? I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but I developed sinus. Is that, could that be related to that? And if so, should I take antibiotics or should I wait it out a couple more days? Her question is, she seems to have a sinus infection. Is it related? It could be, and it may not be. It could be because you see, again, you have the inflammation without the vasoconstriction that you get with the, with the uh, cigarettes. But it also could be just simultaneously you happen to get a sinusitis. So I think that's one we'll leave up for your doctor. Uh, if you want something over the counter to try, you can try some Sudafed. You can buy that over the counter. Take a couple of those tablets three or four times a day. That's free medicine for you. See if it works. But if, it, if your symptoms persist, call your doctor. Sound like something you might hear on television, right? There's a question way in the back here. You're going to have to stand up so I can see you. All right, why don't you come out in the light? Otherwise, we'll miss you completely. All right. I just wondered um, when I'm going to wake up again in the morning and feel without coffee. I mean, I, I wake up at 6 every day, and I'm okay till 8, and then I fall back asleep till 11. <laughs> and it's okay because I'm not working this week, but I have to go back Saturday, and I work 12-hour shifts, and I cannot be on alert in my job. I have to be, I'm a nurse, so I can't screw up. All right. We don't want any nurses screwing up, that's for sure. All right. Let's answer her question, and let's, let's take a little poll here. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you ahead of time. I want to know who's sleeping. I want to know who can't sleep. And I'll tell you right ahead, there's about 10% have trouble sleeping, and about 80% are sleepy. Let's see if I'm right. How many of you here say you're really sleepy? Let me see your hands. How many here say that you're staying awake nights when you should be sleeping? Pretty close, huh? 10%? All right, now, let me say this. For those of you who are really sleepy, what's really happened to you is that you've got your credit card. Well, let me explain that to you. I told you uh, I took a trip to Taiwan to see my grandson. You know what? We, we kept putting it on our credit card. And it was a lot of fun. It wasn't any trouble, you know? <laughs> and then we got home, and they sent us the bill, and I looked at it, and I said, Wow! Did we spend all that money on this trip? Got the credit card. Now, you see, by using your caffeine, you have been borrowing from your life reserves. Are you listening? And now I took away the credit card or sent you the bill, and you say, wow, I didn't know I was this tired. You need that sleep, my dear. You have it coming. Don't let anybody deprive you of it. And in two or three days, you'll be awake. Because <laughs> you will have paid back what you owe the system, and you won't even need the caffeine to wake up. You'll be awake and alert and alive on your own. Won't that be good? I think that'll be fun. Now, some of you that are having trouble sleeping, that may take a little longer. That has to do with that hypothalamus again. But it will straighten around. I remember a fellow at the VA hospital where I work came to one of my clinics. He told me that he only slept about three hours a night for the first two months. He said, the funniest part of it is I'm not tired. I said, I wish I could get on a program like that. But he squared around and was perfectly all right, and he didn't go back to smoking. So remember this, your body will go back to feeling normal and better than normal once you quit smoking. So your rest, as soon as you've paid it back, you'll be alert and alive and ready to go. And if you have trouble waking up in the morning, were you here last night? I explained that to you. Anybody try that cold shower? There's a few hearty souls here. I ought to ask you. We ought to ask you about it, but it worked. All right, here's a question over here. 
I'd like to know, first of all, about the ringing in the ears, okay? Second of all, um, I'd like to know if we're going to get a chance to meet your wonderful wife that you've been promising <laughs> us for the last two days. See, somebody can get my wife to come and she probably won't, but try it. And thirdly, irritability, is it mostly the chemical change, the physical change, or is it mostly psychological, or is it a combination of both? Well, the irritability is largely um, physical, and it's due to the uh, withdrawal process. I'm forgetting some of the questions here. Ringing in the ears. In the ears. Uh, that's not a common one, uh, but uh, I'm not surprised at anything caused by this because of the fact everything is balanced, blood vessels, and the ringing in the ears is usually a vascular phenomenon. And I would suggest that will probably take, uh, take care of itself. All right, we had one. We'll take this gentleman's question right here. Is it true that... Uh the highest cases of impotency is caused by smoking? Or that um, the majority of it is caused by smoking? Certainly, its effect, his question is impotency. That's probably some of the good news. I, I figured we'd get around to it sooner or later. Uh, the commonest causes of impotency are two, I guess, vascular. One, vascular, and the other one is psychological. Now, psychological, probably won't be affected. But vascular will be affected, and there's no question that one's active sex life will last much longer if they don't smoke than if they do. And I believe God invented sex, and uh, he has some parameters that it should be conducted under, but um, that's, that's, that's good news, all right? Yes, uh, we'll take this question here. I'm having quite a problem with concentration. Uh, you mentioned it yesterday. We didn't talk about it. But today, it just seemed like everything that I was doing, just like, like in a day, is like it took longer to do than what I wanted to, to have yeah. done. Is Three that, days and you'll be okay. Fourth, it's for sure. You'll be back on the job. And would that also be related with possibly not enough sleep or being tired? Would that? Uh, oh, related? I think it's related to the whole withdrawal process, okay? Well, we kind of cleared the air with questions, didn't we? I'm going to take just a minute or two to share, uh, we, we'll probably have some more time for questions before we get done, but uh, I, I wanted to share that with you. Um, I should also tell you that that wife of mine is an excellent vegetarian cook, and uh, she puts on cooking classes sometimes, and uh, if you want to see my vitality, you know that I eat pretty well. Okay. As long as we're on the topic, um, one of the reasons why I believe our classes do as well as they do is because we try to tackle the whole person, you know? There's a lot of people that would like you to take the cigarette and pull it out of their lives and leave the rest of the life undisturbed. They're same basically psychological attitudes, they're same social attitudes, they're same uh, same spiritual attitudes, their same physical habits that they've always had. And if you do that, what you end up with is a big hole. Now, we try to get you to rearrange several aspects to where you have a good, solid self. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You got a good social side, you got a good spiritual side, you got a good physical side. You're doing everything right for yourself, and if you do that, you may find that when you stop smoking, you start a chain of events that you'll be happy with the rest of your life. Seriously, I've seen it happen to many friends of mine. In fact, is you see these people are back here helping me? Those are people that have been to programs before, and they want to come help you. And they tell me, oh, just look at those people. They're feeling better tonight, and they're right in there pitching for you. Isn't that good? Now, what I know is that if you're feeling good about yourself and if you're feeling well, you're not likely to go back to smoking. And that's what's so important. I believe, and I have said, and it's almost true, there are no ornery people. They're just people that feel badly and act badly because they feel badly. Did you ever notice that there are days when people can dump all over you and it doesn't seem to make any difference? 
And there are other days when somebody says something and you're up on a huff right off. What makes a difference? What makes a difference is how you're feeling about yourself as a person and how you're feeling physically. It also makes a big difference how you feel about yourself once you quit smoking. If you're feeling good about yourself, if your ego system is intact, you feel good about your spiritual self, you feel good about your physical self, you feel good about your mental self, you have good social relationships. Why you wouldn't want to mess yourself up, would you? Now, one of the things I'm going to start meddling a little bit here to start thinking about is what you eat. And maybe I can illustrate it this way. Most of the foods that we take in, I can make a difference whether they're protein, fat, or carbohydrate, if we're going to turn those into energy, somehow we've got to get them started as blood glucose. Everything works to turn stuff into glucose. And glucose is the energy food, that's the blood sugar she was telling us about, that runs around um, in your veins. And that combines with oxygen, it's much more complicated than this, but we'll make it a simple formula, to produce energy. Now, if this is burning cleanly, you feel pretty good. This is actually accelerated by some B vitamins, largely B1. Now, I should tell you, because time is short, that most of our energy foods that many of us are getting come from refined foods rather than wholesome whole foods. And we get a lot of sugar. There's sugar in most everything that's manufactured. And they're out to fool you, I should tell you that. They'll put three or four sugars in there so they don't have to put sugar at the, at the top of the list. They want it to taste like everything you're used to tasting, but they want you to think it's wholesome. And there's all kinds of falseness in advertising. And if we have time, we may talk about some of that when we're talking about weight control. But how much Vitamin B1, is there in sugar? None. A lot of our energy comes from fats, refined fats. How much vitamin B1 is there in fat? None. Now, if I go to the operating room after I've done a, a big case, and I find the patient pulling out all the tubes and the intravenous fluids and stuff we put in, the first thing I, I, don't, I don't even need to tell the nurse, the nurse will say, I think we better give this man some oxygen. So they'll put an oxygen mask on him. If he doesn't quiet down, they may put him back on the respirator. We'll draw some blood gases. Because he's oxygen deficient, he's burning sooty, okay? And his brain is not getting nice, clean burn. And so he's irritable and irascible and upset. Now see what happens. If we don't get enough B1 when we burn our glucose, we're likely to be irascible, irritable and upset. And if you're irascible, irritable, and upset, what is the next thing you want? You want a cigarette. You want a cigarette. Um, an interesting study was done um, in a hospital in Minneapolis. This actually happened. A fellow decided he was going to check on the neuromuscular benefits of vitamin B1. So he went to the typing pool in the hospital he counted all the mistakes the typist made. Then he got permission from the uh, hospital uh, medical librarian to put them on a B1 deficient diet. And then he was going to count the mistakes they made to see how much difference it made when they didn't have adequate B1. He came back about the third day, and the medical record librarian threw him out and said, get out of here with your miserable experience. This experiment, this actually happened. She wouldn't even let him in there to count the mistakes. She said there was so much hassling and irritable and fighting going on in the typing pool that nothing was getting typed. <laughs> B1. Did you ever stop to think that when you yell at the kids in the morning, it may be that they didn't have a decent breakfast and you didn't have a decent breakfast? You know our big sources of vitamin B1? Whole grains. Whole grains. 
the bran, the alarill, all of that around the outside of the wheat. Oats is one of your best sources of vitamin B1. It's sort of interesting that um, uh, Samuel Johnson, when he wrote his Dictionary of the English Language, several, you know, back around the turn of the century, he came to the definition of oats. And this is what he actually wrote in his dictionary. Oats. A cereal grain that in England we feed the horses, but the Scotchmen eat it. <laughs> uh, you know, he had that little ziggy for the Scotchman. But it's interesting what the Scotchman wrote back to him. He said, look what beautiful horses you have in England and what beautiful men we have in Scotland. <laughs> so um, I want you to start thinking about what you have for breakfast. Start with a good whole grain. There's nothing better than oatmeal. If you go across the bridge into Canada, they make a great cereal up there called Red River cereal. It's a, so I see some people nodding their head. They know that cereal. Cook that up, put a little fruit in it, a little raisins, eat a little applesauce. Woo -hoo! I mean, you're going to get the vitamins, and you're going to be alert, and you're going to be alive. That's the only thing, really, my wife lets me make. Sunday morning, I make the oatmeal. Oh, I do a good job. I mean, I know how to cook the water and everything. <laughs> but um, that's, that's good food. When you eat that whole grain, when you eat the food like the Lord put it in the vine and in the plant, you've got real food. Yeah, get your B1 vitamin from your whole grains. Don't go off to the store and buy it because you're missing all the other stuff. You know what I'm saying? The bran, the fiber, the minerals. The other vitamins that you need that they've taken out of the food. Well, look at the time. Goes whizzing away, doesn't it, when you're having fun? Yeah. How do you feel? You're glad you're quitting smoking? Do you love being free from smoking? We better say it. I love being free from smoking. Now that's God bless you and good night. But if you haven't quite quit, stick right around. The rest of you slip out quietly. I'm going to come down and have a little conversation with you. Please don't leave if you haven't got it made. <laughs>